Right. So moving, moving on. Uh, so we are, we are in the section of uh, uh, part of the of the lecture on free energy perturbation, and uh, you might you might ask, what about entropy? I mean, can we calculate entropy uh, following the same principle? Well, entropy is far more challenging, and when I say entropy, it's also true for enthalpy. It's far more challenging uh, than free energy because you're not just dealing with delta u, you're also dealing with averages directly on u0 and u1. And those are notoriously more difficult to converge than, uh, than the average on, uh, on, on delta u. And so you can use the zwanzig lando formula to calculate delta s. So this is essentially a rewriting or restatement of the Zwanzig perturbation formula for uh, for the entropy. And what you can see here is a, uh, is a little application that we did um, calculating the uh, hydration enthalpy, uh, uh, sorry, hydration enthalpy, hydration free energy, and hydration entropy of ethanol. Uh, and um, you have in black, in dashed line, the straight dashed line here, the straight dashed line here. And here are the experimental values. And so we are comparing, uh, um, uh, well, the free energy, the evolution of the free energy, the evolution of the uh, enthalpy, and the evolution of the entropy uh, with time. And you can see that in a matter of eight nanoseconds, you already have converged and gotten the, uh, the estimate of your uh, hydration free energy, not too far from the experimental value. It takes way longer to get a converged uh, uh, entropy. And that's kind of connected to what I said previously about you know, the convergence of the, uh, the averages over uh, the, the potential energy in zero. And, An alternate route uh, to compute the, uh, the, uh, the entropy uh, that was uh, actually used by uh, Ron Levy is uh, uh, from finite differences. So you, you remember that the, 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 the entropy formally can be uh, uh, defined. So if I use the uh, Helmholtz uh, free energy, not the Gibbs free energy, but the Helmholtz free energy, uh, it's the derivative of the fringe with respect to temperature at constant number of particles and, and, and volume. Meaning that you can uh, 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 compute the entropy uh, uh, from finite difference. So you run a simulation at a certain temperature and you run a simulation at another temperature and, uh, and, uh, and you take difference between the, uh, the, the two free energies and you divide by the two, uh, two delta T. Now, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's tricky to do that because um, um, you really have to pay attention to the uh, temperature increments that, uh, that, you, that, you, that you're that you going to use. So, uh, so you can write this in terms of finite differences as delta A at T plus delta T minus delta A at T minus delta T divided by two delta T. Uh, if your delta T is too small, then, um, then of course, the, uh, the, 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 the variation of free energy will be on the order of the error. And uh, so that's not really good. And, but if your delta T is too large, then the uh, assumption that you can use uh, a finite difference is no longer uh, valid. So you really have to find a, a um, uh, to try, you know, different values, different increments of the temperature, uh, you know, that, that gives you a, a satisfactory uh, things. So um, how do we do these simulations uh, in, in practice? So I was talking about ethanol hydration. So you want to complete this uh, thermodynamic cycle 
And we're going to see that we can actually compute uh, delta G of hydration directly. And that's using uh, 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 geometric transformation. But from the point of view of uh, perturbation theory or alchemical transformation, uh, we're going to do it uh, uh, with the vertical transformation. So we need two setups. Uh, one is uh, with ethanol in, a, in bulk water and one is ethanol in vacuum. And you make ethanol uh, disappear uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bulk water and you also make ethanol disappear in, in, in vacuum. And that gives you uh, this delta G A back, delta G A back. And, and, and you take the difference of the two and that gives you a hydration. Do I need, why do I need to complete the full, the full cycle? That's a pretty good, uh, 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 an, an important question. But the, the reason is very simple. Uh, you have different dielectric environments. And if you remember on Zager theory, uh, so Onzager says that uh, the electrostatic component of the free energy is related to the, uh, to the dipole moment of the molecule uh, and the dielectric uh, and the dielectric constants. Uh, we know that for a flexible molecule in a low dielectric component, the molecule will tend to adopt a conformation that minimizes its dipole moment, whether, whereas in uh, in a in a bulk environment, it will uh, in a, sorry in a bulk environment of high dielectric constant, uh, it will tend to adopt a conformation that maximizes its dielectric uh, its dipole moment. So uh, resulting uh, uh, so you 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 have very different conformations and therefore uh, very different. Um, uh, very different uh, intramolecular interactions because of different conformation. And so uh, you cannot just assume which uh, this keyword control. If you put alk decoupled on, you assume that your intramolecular interactions are the same in vacuum and uh, in, the, in the condensed phase, and therefore you don't need to do the, uh, the vacuum calculation. Uh, that's a wrong assumption. So by default, I would also always keep a decouple off. Okay. Uh, so coming back to uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, hydration calculation, hydration of training the hydration calculation. So we did the simulation forward and backward in vacuum in water. We get uh, with the bar estimator, we get uh, minus 5.2. In vacuum, we get minus 9.6. In water, you take the difference and you get minus 4.4. Experimental value is minus 5.1. Calculations converge. Now, you have to also remember that the force field is not perfect and, uh, and there are certainly effects in the force field that are not accounted for. Uh, and, and, and that explains why you are uh, essentially KT, uh, KBT away from the uh, experimental value. So uh, good practices, uh, just like any experimental measurements, uh, you have to provide the free energy uh, estimate with an estimate of the error. And when I talk about error, uh, I want to impress upon you that there are different sources of error. There's a statistical error in the systematic error. So the statistical error essentially is something that you can somewhat control. Uh, um, uh, it will be, for instance, uh, you know, how well you describe. So in a hydration free energy, it will be how well you describe uh, or you, you sample the different configurations of the solvents around your solute. Uh, 
which is not to be confused with systematic error, which can have many different sources. So uh, systematic error, there can be the force field in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the systematic error. There can be also the finite lengths of, of this simulation. And let me give you an example. Imagine that you have two conformations of your solute. And these two conformations are separated by a high free energy barrier so that when you do your simulation, when you do your hydration free energy calculation, uh, the length of the simulation is not good enough that you can visit the two conformation. You know, the, the free energy barrier is too high. So if you start with one conformation, you will probably end up with the same conformation. The problem is that the two conformations contribute to the hydration free energy. So you can do a very good job from the statistical point of view of sampling all the configuration of the solvent molecules around one of the two conformations. But you did a very lousy job in terms of sampling the two conformations. You can address that. I mean, people like Benoit Roux, for instance, uh, has introduced uh, uh, boosting potential. So essentially, when you do your hydration free energy calculation, you add an external potential of mean force, uh, uh, an external potential that describes the, 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 the proportional potential. So basically, will accelerate uh, the, uh, the, the, the conformational transition between the two states. Uh, another way uh, is uh, to, uh, to run the, uh, the simulation at, um, um, let's say, to do the equivalent of parallel tempering. We call that Hamiltonian hopping. Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. But essentially, it's swapping the coordinates uh, of your simulation box with the values of lambda. So you have like a simulation box that is representative of a certain lambda value, and you have another simulation box. It's a set of coordinates representative of another lambda value. And so you will, you will swap the set of coordinates. And you do that regularly. And the hope is that uh, uh, when you do that, uh, and especially if you swap coordinates when the molecule has essentially disappeared, when, the, when uh, it's becoming easier uh, from an intramolecular interaction point of view uh, uh, to, to change the conformation. Um, the hope is that you will favor, in doing so, you will favor transition between conformations. Uh, so I was mentioning uh, uh, a, a, an important thing is to, uh, to measure uh, or to, to look at the degree of overlap between the uh, probability distribution reflecting ensemble configurations of the initial state and the final state, um, uh, you know, how much they overlap. Uh, but, you know, based on the degree of overlap, you can actually infer some uh, some estimates of the systematic component of uh, of your error. It's it's an approximation, but you know some people do. Um, stratification definitely is something that you need to do, and we've seen that if you don't do it, uh, you have a, a high risk. Of getting the uh, poor estimate uh, of, of, of the free energy. Uh, it's huge errors. So, this stratification is a good way to reduce the variance and, and improve you know, the overlap between distributions at every step. And uh, uh, so you have to do it. And of course, combining forward and backward simulation is good because you know, it gives you an idea. Of degree of overlap, but also you can plug this uh, this uh, intermediate uh, simulations and plug that into the bar estimator, 
and, and get a better estimate than the, uh, the simple FEP estimate. Okay, so I'm done with uh, uh, perturbation theory and uh, ultimate transformation. Now I'm gonna move to uh, geometrical frenzy calculations. Uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, approaches that you can use to, uh, to transform uh, uh, transform the system by, by changing the, uh, the coordinates. Uh, uh, one of the methods that you may have heard of, very popular method, is called metadynamics. That's from the group of Michele Parinello here, but uh, that finds its uh, foundations uh, in earlier uh, uh, papers, so the, the Lyo and Carinello papers in 2002, but the foundations can be found in a paper by Helmut Grubmüller here, uh, on transformational flooding, and one by the group of Wilfried von Dijkstern here for uh, local elevation. So the idea here is essentially to add uh, uh, Gaussians, little Gaussians, that uh, you you add little Gaussians to flood the values of your uh, drainage heat landscape until essentially you have a, a, a flat free energy landscape on which your system can can diffuse freely. And since you keep track uh, on the on the Gaussians that you add, then you, you always know you know by which degree or to which degree you have bias to system and, and, and able to recover your, uh, your unbiased, uh, unbiased drainage. Um, now, the problem with uh, the uh, uh, metadynamics, the original approach of metadynamics is because you keep adding uh, Gaussians and Gaussians and Gaussians and Gaussians, as you can see here, it never really converges towards the expected reference. Uh, so it kind of fluctuates around the reference free energy curve. And that's the reason why there are many variants of metadynamics, uh, chief among which is uh, the so-called well-tempered uh, uh, well metadynamics, uh, whereby uh, you start with rather large Gaussians, and when you know, as you uh, first, uh, as you evolve uh, uh, in, uh, in in your in your simulation, uh, the Gaussians become smaller and smaller. At some point, you can you can show that uh, uh, there's actually a good paper by James Dema uh, from the uh, Greg Voss group showing that uh, you do have. A, uh, a long time convergence behavior, which is not the case with uh, plain metadynamics. With plain metadynamics, there is no long time uh, convergence. Now, uh, going back to uh, a, a question that was asked earlier by Delara uh, about Angola sampling. So now we go back to uh, these two guys. So we, I already introduced you to. Uh, Jean-Pierre Vallot and this is Glenn Torrey. Back in 1977, these two guys proposed a method that is still used widely uh, today, even though, uh, and that's the greatest annoyance of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Vallot, that people claim they use Angola sampling, but they don't really use Angola sampling. They use something else that uh, I will refer to as uh, super stratification or hyper stratification. Uh, umbrella sampling is a little bit different conceptually. Uh, so the idea is uh, imagine that you have this uh, uh, free energy landscape that you want to calculate. That. That's the actual free energy landscape. You don't know exactly uh, a priori what it looks like, but uh, uh, for, the, for, for the demonstration, for the illustration, uh, that's that's the actual energy landscape, and uh, the idea of umbrella sampling is because when I do Boltzmann sampling, 
uh, I will essentially favor uh, uh, the low energy configurations, there's very little chance that I'll be able to overcome this barrier. Uh, so let's say that I start with my solutes. So obviously here it's a hydrophobic solute that I want to bring in, a, in the middle of a water uh, lamella, a water medium. Uh, there is very little chance that if I start with my solute in, uh, in the gas space, that it will actually cross the, uh, uh, the water air interface and go into water if the free energy barrier is too high. So the idea is to uh, imagine uh, uh, the shape of an external potential to force actually uh, 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 my, my solute to go to, to, to water. And so ideally, uh, that external potential should have uh, uh, the, the shape of the negative of uh, my, my, my exact free energy surface, except that I don't really know what my uh, exact free energy surface looks like. So I have to imagine what my, my view bias, my biasing potential should look like. So um, what, uh, what, what people do usually when, when, when they think about umbrella sampling is that the first is stratify in the spirit of Valo and Card. Uh, um, pretty big chunks, actually, uh, uh, six, seven, eight, uh, angstrom broad, and uh, and in uh, in a given window, uh, they apply two types of potential. They apply a confinement potential to prevent sampling from spilling on the left or on the right. But that's not enough because if I just have this confinement potential and I run MD, I will be stuck here uh, in the left of, uh, of, my, uh, of my window around minus 15 angstrom sampling this low energy configurations. So that's not good. What I want is to impose a potential. So my U bias here, that is ideally the negative of the free energy such that when I add it to my potential energy function, then it, it gives a, a flat free energy landscape. So now I will be diffusing on a flat free energy landscape. But that will give me, going back to Galara's uh, question, it will give me a, a uniform probability distribution. If I didn't have this biasing potential, this, uh, this U bias, my probability distribution would look like a peak uh, on the left hand side of the, the window and essentially nothing uh, in the rest of the uh, in the rest of the window I'd be essentially sampling uh, low energy states okay so i do that for the different windows uh, you will note that these different windows have some overlap it's important uh, because uh, we're dealing with, uh, uh, we, we need we need an overlap to reconstruct the full uh, free energy uh, landscape from minus twenty five to zero, and so uh, you can do that manually. Uh, in the old days, people did that manually. They would uh, uh, try to minimize the difference in curvature in uh, in, the, in the in the potential of mean force in the overlap region uh, and, and then shift because uh, of course the free energy is always defined up to uh, uh, a constant. But uh, uh, since uh, 1992 and, uh, and, uh, and the publication of the weighted histogram analysis method, which is based on the, on the ferenberg swenson uh, equation, uh, uh, people use this, uh, this algorithm. So it's a set of equations that uh, you have to solve um, uh, in an iterative fashion. Uh, you know what kind of biases you have introduced. You have your biased distributions uh, coming from your simulations, but what you need, what you want to get is the uh, is the final is the final free energy. So you solve that iteratively and you get it. 
energy. So I was saying that these days, nobody does that. Nobody wants to guess what the biasing potential should be. So what people do, they call that umbrella sampling. What they do is a super stratification, meaning that they chop the reaction path into many, 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 many small windows, many, many narrow windows. And the reason why they do that is, and they apply confinement potential for, for each window they apply confinement potential. But the windows are very small. I mean, the difference in free energy in each window is less than KT. So even if you run Boltzmann sampling in this window, you can be sure that you will sample all the configurations uh, uh, across, across this, this narrow window. And so you do that for this many, uh, in this many strata, in this many windows. And again, you plug the results, you plug your bias probability distribution into, into one, and you get the uh, energy profile. A different approach uh, was uh, uh, introduced in uh, 2001 by, uh, uh, by uh, Andrew Pohorelli and uh, Eric Darf. Um, and that's, a, that's not a, it's not a histogram based method. It's, a, it's actually a gradient based method. So the idea here is uh, you define uh, your collective variable interest and, uh, and you will calculate along this collective variable interest, you will calculate the force that is exerted and, uh, and you will store this force. Uh, so you discretize the reaction pathway, discretize this collective variable in very small increment, very small boxes and in each box, you, you store the, uh, the value of the local force that is exerted along the, the, the collective variable. And at some point, uh, that's user defined, at some point, you will calculate the expected value of this local force. And it so happens that this expected value is equal to the gradient of the free energy, hence, uh, the, the, the notion, the concept of gradient-based approach. So in this little movie that I showed, um, let's go back to the slide. Uh, in this little movie that I showed here on the, on the left-hand side, I'm showing a, um, a converged value here, the, the reference value. And here I'm showing how my free energy evolved using this approach. You can see that, well, at first, you know, I, I kind of overshot the free energy. And the reason is uh, I apply, I calculated my expected value a little bit too early before I had enough samples. And so I kind of drove the system out of equilibrium. But at some point, the system or you know, the calculation heals itself. And then we converge toward the expected potential. Had I not used this method, uh, I would be sampling essentially this minimum here, which corresponds to the uh, folded alpha helical state. But uh, then uh, when, I, uh, when I start applying uh, the uh, average force uh, along the, the, the collective variable, direction of the collective variable, uh, then, then I start sampling uh, this higher Free energy state all the way to uh, a family of uh, extended structures, extended complements. The beauty of this is uh, you can see that as, uh, as the reverse of uh, or the opposite of, of metadynamics. In metadynamics, you are flooding the, uh, the free energy landscape. Here, in, uh, with this uh, method called adaptive biasing force, you're actually crushing. Uh, the mountains, uh, the, the summits of the free energy landscape. So that in the end, you have a flat free energy landscape, same idea, flat free energy landscape uh, uh, on which you are diffusing such that every state becomes probable or equi-probable. And, and in the end, if you look at the distribution, so the histograms of the of 
for the different values of psi, well, in principle, you should get something that is uh, uh, almost uh, completely flat, meaning that uh, you have uh, uh, sampled the different states with an equal. So uh, this is available, uh, this methodology is available uh, in NAMD as part of uh, the COVARS module. So you will have to define a collective variable. And in this case, in this particular case, uh, which is actually illustrated in, uh, in uh, OIL, uh, you will have to define a collective variable. I'm sure that Jerome will talk about it. Uh, more detail. Uh, and so that's an illustration of what's actually happening. Uh, you can look at these different points, A, B, and C, and, and you can calculate for these different values, these different bins, different values of psi, you can calculate the distribution of the local force. And you can see that this local force first is Gaussian distributed, but if you look at the maximum of the Gaussian is uh, actually uh, when this energy is, uh, is going down, is, uh, uh, is decreasing, uh, means that the uh, local force, the peak of the local force distribution is slightly positive, whereas when this energy is going up, the Gaussian distribution uh, on the middle, and of course, when it's flat, then, then it's, uh, it's peak. That's the, uh, that's the Green curve. Um, we have reconciled uh, metadynamics and, uh, uh, and ADF um, in a method called uh, meta EADF, uh, which essentially uh, takes uh, it's the, the best of both worlds. It exploits it exploits the uh, uh, the, the, the fast uh, exploration of the free energy landscape by metadynamics. And at the same time, uh, uses the very accurate gradients provided by uh, force. And if you compare uh, pure metadynamics, I already mentioned that meta, the pure metadynamics that doesn't have a, a, a long time convergence. You can see here that very quickly we, we converge towards expected value. So that's also available in uh, 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 So how do we run this, uh, this simulations, uh, this adaptive bison force simulations with COVARS? Uh, so as always, we need uh, an equilibrated uh, configuration. So Cartesian coordinates, velocities, and the information about uh, the very demanded conditions. We also need a Colvar style wherein we define the different collective variables. And what you want to do with these collective variables, you can just you know, do some uh, simulation with constraints, but you can also apply some time dependent biases, which would be uh, in adaptive bias and force calculation, also the PSF, traditional PSF file, and your NAND file. And it will generate for you, uh, in addition to the traditional log file from NAMD, it will generate a state file that you know, gives you uh, the uh, accurate state of the calculation, uh, in which you can use in case you want to restart your simulation, but also a trashed file that contains the, uh, the instantaneous values of the collective variables in the course of the simulation. Now, if you want to do an adaptive bias and force calculation, on top of that, you'll have a gradient file that contains the gradients uh, uh, for the collective variables, uh, and a PMF file that contains the, uh, the potential of the force, the free energy uh, profile uh, along, along the, uh, the collective variable, plus the count file, which you can see as your probability distribution, the number of samples uh, for the different values of the, uh, of the collective variable, which you have to look at to assess whether uh, your probability uh, is uniform or not. Remember what I was saying about uh, ethanol hydration and 
uh, how we estimated it uh, by considering the, 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 the vertical transformation uh, using flow energy perturbation. And I was telling you, we can do the calculations directly, calculate delta G hydration directly. Well, that, for that, we need to invoke a different setup. So it's the same box of water, but we will leave extra space above and below to describe the gas phase. And we will place our solute in, uh, in, in vacuum in the gas phase sufficiently far from the water-air interface so that it doesn't feel it. And now my reaction coordinate model is the uh, distance uh, between the center of the mass of ethanol and the center of mass of the water phase projected onto the z-axis. And now I'm going to use uh, the adaptive biasing force to not drag the solute towards the, uh, the bulk phase, but let it diffuse freely. Uh, and, and so at some point, uh, it will feel, um, uh, will feel the barriers and, and, and because I'm applying a time-dependent bias, it will uh, overcome the barrier uh, that prevents uh, free diffusion along the reaction coordinates. So, uh, and you know, in doing so, I uh, I, uh, I measure the free energy along uh, along Z and I'm able to uh, to generate uh, a free energy profile. But this is what uh, the curl bars looks like. So the, uh, the key word here is distance Z. That's the projected uh, distance onto the Z axis. Projected distance between the two uh, the two uh, the two centers of mass. Uh, and this is the kind of free energy profile that I obtain. And of course, uh, the difference between the two plateaus, so that's the plateau in, uh, in water and that's the plateau in the air. Of course, you expect to get this kind of profile. Uh, ethanol is a hydrophilic molecule. It likes to be in water. So that's, you expect the free energy to be lower for water than for the gas phase. The free energy difference between the two plateaus is the hydration free energy. The free energy difference between the minimum here that you find at the Gibbs dividing surface, so basically at the interface, and, uh, and, uh, and water, that's the adsorption free energy. Okay. Um, now, a nice thing about, about ADF and, and the way we have implemented it in, uh, in NAMDI uh, pole bars is that once you have the trajectory that gave you this potential of mean force calculation, you can actually go back to this trajectory, uh, which is available in a so-called DCD file. And, uh, and Mandy has a nice feature that allows you to loop over the different configuration of the DCD file, and you can recalculate for groups of atoms you can recalculate your energy and your force uh, uh, and consider the van der Waals contributions to the force and the electrostatic contributions to the force, which is a nice way to decompose uh, your free energy uh, profile into electrostatic and uh, van der Waals contribution. I know exactly what comes from which. Is it clear for everyone or uh, are there any questions so far? Delara, no question. Oh yes, there is a, there is a question. Uh, I'm listening. Oh, there is Delara and there's, uh, yeah, please. I cannot hear you. I, I cannot hear you. There's no sound. I, I cannot hear your knitting either. So I just want to confirm something is wrong with your microphone probably. Well, maybe in the meantime, Delara, can you ask your question? Delara?
Hello, Delara, can you ask a question? Uh, okay, yes, yes, sure. Something was wrong with my uh, microphone. Thanks again for your great presentation. Uh, can you go back to um, previous uh, slides? To the previous I slide. want the, the preparation. Yes. Yeah, the, the umbrella slide. sampling. Yeah. This one? To the umbrella sampling. Ah, to the umbrella sampling. Sorry. Let me see. Sorry, sorry. Yes, umbrella sampling, please. Yes. Uh, the, the real umbrella sampling or the super stratification? Yes, here. This one. Okay. I think uh, here is okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, I know that uh, in number sampling, we have uh, several windows um, That's from correct. the, for example, the state that, yes, we have several windows. I want to know that these windows themselves are overlapping. For example, if I put one of the windows from um, zero to one angstrom, am I going to put the other one from, for example, um, 0 0.9 it's, to, yeah. for example, yes. you know, Yes, windows it, are not overlapping themselves. They, they, they need they need to overlap. In umbrella sampling, it's a prerequisite. Okay. They need to overlap. In fact, actually, I have to thank you again because I forgot to say something important about ABF. In ABF, You're you can you can actually if you know if you're dealing, you were mentioning probability calculations. Probability calculation, you have to cover a very long pathway. When you go from one side of the bilayer to the other side of the bilayer, typically something like 80 angstroms. Uh, and you cannot do that in a single window. So you usually also stratify. But the nice thing about ABF is because it's a gradient based approach, the force is continuous across the reaction pathway, which is not the case in umbrella sampling because you don't have this concept of force in umbrella sampling. So in ABF, there is no need for uh, overlap of the windows. Whereas in umbrella sampling, even if you super stratify, you still need to have some, uh, some overlap in order to, to be able to reconstruct your free energy landscape. And that's again, by virtue of the fact that your free energy is defined up to a constant. So what one will do for you is, uh, is try to find this, uh, this constant uh, between the different bits and pieces of the PMF. Am I okay, making sense? Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, yes, yes, thanks a lot. And now I want to know, uh, you told that in, uh, again, in the previous slide, you told that if we uh, take a wider window, uh, then only maybe we have um, sampling from the left side. Um, I'm thinking that uh, even if uh, when we have uh, several windows, again, we are sampling the left side of the window, but maybe because no, we was, have too many windows, was, uh, it doesn't make uh, I was, any no, I, was, I, was, I was commenting on, on classical umbrella sampling, which nobody, uh, nobody uh, mm -hmm. does, uh, but uh, okay. because it's a pain, it's a pain in the neck to have to guess the shape of the uh, of the uh, of the bias that you have to add, bias. Uh, the external mm -hmm. bias. If you get the wrong bias, uh, if you have the wrong bias, there is a good chance indeed that you will be sampling preferentially the the the, the, the left hand side of the of the curve, which happens to be uh, where uh, you have like the low energy configurations. That's, that's why it was on the left. It could have been on the right, but in that particular case, uh, mm -hmm. the energy was lower on the left. And, uh, and by virtue of Boltzmann yes. sampling, we would sample preferentially these regions. Okay. But you mean when we have several windows near and in the two-day uh, umbrella sampling, um, they are sampling uh, not only the left side of the window, no. maybe I mean, the whole you, part you, of that. If, you, if you're doing what people do these days, you know, breaking the simulation okay. uh, or the pathway into many, many, many windows. These very yes. small windows, you don't have this problem anymore because they're so narrow. Okay. The free energy difference between the mm -hmm. windows is so small that you guarantee that you will sample it uniformly. Okay. That's the trick. Thanks a lot. Uh, I got it, thanks. The other person, the, the person with the N, 
Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly. Sorry. My question was uh, that uh, you created this system of water, water and vacuum. If I put water uh, in a box, like so, so I want to know like the method of developing this kind of system. Yeah, so uh, it, it's a good it's a good question. I was again uh, as skimped on the details, and I apologize for that. Uh, that simulation here, you want to simulate a, a constant volume. You want to simulate it in uh, in the canonical ensemble because it's, it's simulated. Uh, uh, in the uh, isobaric isothermal ensemble, as we did for uh, the fringy perturbation for the for the vertical legs, then of course the box will close on itself because uh, uh, it will it will remove uh, by virtue of the piston and uh, it will remove the vacuum. So that's why you need to impose you need to impose the volume of the box and maintain this uh, this uh, gas phase above and below the water lamina. Am I making sense? So this is NVT? Pardon me? This is NVT simulation, right? Yeah, it's the canonical ensemble. Yes, it's NVT, yes, absolutely. But still, if I put uh, water in uh, a box, then water will try to take the volume of that box. No, no. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Actually, the, uh, the, 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 the water lamella, remember that uh, this will be a 2D system. You will have this uh, periodic boundary conditions anyway, and, and, uh, and uh, you will have, uh, you, will have the, uh, you will have a perfectly fine uh, water lamella, perfectly fine water air interface. I guarantee it. Occasionally, Occasionally, you will have like. Uh, but keep in mind what the uh, um, what uh, the uh, the cohesion energy of water is, and uh, uh, occasionally you will see one water molecule desorb from the from the from the water air interface, but it will come back pretty quickly. Those are pretty stable water air in I mean, pretty stable interface. Don't have to worry about that. Actually, uh, this is part of the uh, this is part of the tutorial, so you can you you will you will be able to check for yourself that uh, it does remain it does remain a, a water air interface. Okay. So, Chris, thank you. Even Actually, you I was went... thinking in some other aspect that we can create uh, create some kind of um, constraint at the surfaces. You don't need to put any constraints or restraints or anything, no. Okay. Uh, my other question is regarding umbrella sampling. So there is a K, this K value, the spin constant, which you use. Yes. Well, uh, so yes. If, if there will, uh, like, yeah, this will be a this major effect on the calculation of PMF if I, if I change the K value. I'm sorry. Uh, the K value, the K value is the force constant for the walls, for the confinement potential. That's uh, what you, that's the potential that you add to prevent spilling across windows. And that's, and that's what you have to feed to, uh, to WAM uh, to recover the free energy landscape. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Yes, hi, Professor. Hi. Um, so my question is, if you are trying to study the effect of mutations on the protein structure and conformation, which method do you recommend for calculating the free energy changes? Or like, which is the most commonly used method? For mutations, uh, you don't have much choice. I mean, you have to go back to the first part of the lecture. You have to do an alchemical transformation. Now, depending on the software that you will be using and, and, and your preference, and uh, you can use either uh, free energy perturbation or thermodynamic integration, which are the two 
uh, methods that are available in uh, in NAMD uh, to get your uh, to get your free energy change. Uh, now, what you're saying is, uh, uh, if, I'm not quite sure I understand what you what you want to do. You want to do a mutation, but this mutation induces a conformational transition. Is that correct? Yes. So, for example, if I'm studying um, like a single glycine or any mutations in collagen, then I know the triple helix structure of collagen gets actually altered. Yeah. Uh, so, so, in that case, if we are doing MD simulations, I would just wondering like what would be the best method to calculate these free energy changes well i mean you have two things really that are happening at the same time here and you have like the conformational change but the conformational change is related to the uh to the uh, to the mutation so i mean the first thing you'll have to do is first do the mutation and see what happens upon the mutation. But it's very possible that in terms of uh, simulation, just doing the mutation is not enough to trigger uh, the conformational change, which happens maybe on a time scale that is not amenable to, uh, to the kind of sampling that you, are, uh, that, you, that, you, that you are doing. So it's also possible that you uh, that you may need to, uh, to study the conformational change with a, 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 a more appropriate method. But definitely for the mutation, I mean, you have no choice. You have to use uh, one of these alchemical uh, fringe methods. Okay, thank you so much. Emma, do you wanted to say something? Yes, I was going to actually ask, as you bring the molecule close to the water yeah. interface, water air inter interface or water vacuum interface, uh, does it kind of promote water molecules to leave the water phase and get closer to the vacuum phase kind of? Uh, I mean, there is a little bit of desorption. I mean, occasionally, yeah. you see, and, 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 and this is, more prone to happen with certain solutes than other. Uh, definitely, if you bring, uh, let's say, benzene or uh, a methane or an ethane, you see the very little desorption. If you have something that is highly polar, not even mentioning uh, something charged, then of course, uh, you'll see some water molecule, you know, coming, right. try to meet and greet the salute as it comes right. into the boat. Right, right, right. Okay, Definitely. cool. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, uh, as you can see, I didn't mention that, uh, uh, but if you look at the potential of mean force, it's very interesting that the minimum of the free energy is not in water, but at the Gibbs dividing surface. Uh, and, yeah. and you can explain that in the case of, uh, of, uh, of methanol, uh, by, by a segregation at the interface of right. the hydroxyl group that is kind of buried is burying yeah. its head in water and the fatty parts so of the the, the, right. the, the the CH3 trying to show its butt to the uh, to the vacuum yeah. and so it's kind of happy at uh, at this position I was exactly looking at that actually trying to see what is going on Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to finish because I've already taken some time from uh, from Jerome and I have to apologize to him. It will be taken like uh, 15 minutes. I'm just going to conclude or finish with uh, some uh, some practices, uh, good practices, guidelines, uh, and recommendations. So when you do uh, uh, adaptive biasing force calculations, you, you you want to some extent to, uh, uh, to break your, your reaction pathway, especially when you have a long reaction pathway, you want to stratify. And you can, you can show uh, uh, as a matter of principle that uh, the time needed to, 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 to sample the, uh, the entire pathway will be always greater than the sum of times to, uh, to sample the different windows. Um, uh, that part is no longer true, and I have to apologize uh, 
thanks to the work of Jerome, uh, uh, you, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, geometrical restraints. And uh, uh, we use, I mean, we use a lot uh, the extended Lagrangian formulation of ABF. Uh, in fact, meta, uh, the, 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 the method that I introduced earlier, the combination of metadynamics and uh, adaptive bias and force that you're using uh, an extended Lagrangian formulation of ABF, which I didn't really detail in a nutshell, maybe Jerome will talk about it in a nutshell. Instead of tracking uh, the collective variable, you are tracking a particle, a fictitious particle that is attached uh, with a stiff spring that is attached to the, uh, to the uh, collective variable. Um, that I will skip, I think I will stop here because I've already spoken too much. Uh, I really would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, do you have, before I, I leave the floor to, uh, to Jerome, uh, do you have any, uh, any uh, other question? Delara, uh, maybe? Are we good? Um, I only want to thank you for the great presentation and answering the, all the questions. Thanks a lot. Okay, and I'm sure that Jerome will be able to answer what any more question that pops in your mind uh, in the rest of the lecture. Thank you so much, guys.